Yep, it has started recording. I hope everyone can see the stream. Today is the fourth lecture of the Mall Bio course. Technically the fifth lecture, but the one lecture was, an, was a guest lecture. So this is the fourth lecture on topic and I'll talk about DNA replication and repair part two. There are quite a few more parts to this, so don't get bored of it already. So last time I showed you this image, let me get the pointer. Yeah, last time I showed you this image and what it means, we talked about uh, DNA primase, the primer itself, ligase, DNA polymerase, we talked about the lagging and the leading strands, we talked about what Okazaki fragments are, how were they discovered, etc. And then uh, today I'll be talking about helicase, topoisomerase, single strand and the single stranded binding proteins as well, as well, like a few more things as well. Anyway, topics covered in this lecture, DNA replication, in that we'll cover the helicase enzyme, the SSBs, which is single stranded binding proteins. Uh, we'll cover the uh, sliding clamp. I think this is SSBPs. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, and can everyone just mute your mic? Please mute your microphones so there's no feedback coming in. So these are SSBPs. I'm sorry about that. Uh, there's a sliding clamp and then we'll do a summary of everything we've done in DNA replication. Then we'll talk about strand-directed mismatch repair. This is quite interesting. And then we'll talk about topoisomerases. And I have one question which I'll ask you to do at your home, like <laughs> not everyone's at home technically, uh, but uh, outside of class. This is one question which I'll give you at the end of the presentation. So first we'll talk about helicase. What is helicase? So we talked about how the DNA polymerase, is, so the strands are getting split, the parent strand, the template strand is getting split and it's being pulled apart and the polymerases are the, uh, is replicating a new new DNA strand upon the template strand. So, but we didn't do what pulls these strand apart. So helicase is the enzyme which pulls these strands apart. And so it, we need a proper enzyme because DNA is very stable. It needs high temperatures to denaze. It's close to 90, 92, 95 degrees Celsius. The exact temperature depends upon your GC content, but it's quite high, close to the boiling point of water. And the uh, so helicases are required to separate the strands, and these helicases can move uh, on either parental strand. So the uh, so they can move in the three prime to five prime direction on one strand, and a five prime to three prime direction on another strand. So they can work on both strands, and it's it's an ATP dependent process because it is pulling apart things. It needs energy. So these uh, so helicases are uh, there's a it's about I think it's a hexamer, and it has six subunits. And each of these six subunits can bind to an ATP molecule and hydrolyze it. So this allows the uh, protein to deform spherically. So it, it uh, gives, it's, gives it a sort of a spin. And this spin helps it move forward and pull apart the DNA strands. So as you see, each movement, as soon as it gets energy from ATP, it moves forward a bit. And, and then another molecule of ATP and moves forward a bit. This is, this is quite a simple description of the process. So we'll talk about, uh, so we'll see what helicase exactly does. So it is only on one strand, it's present only on one strand and uh, the action of it moving forward is pulling apart the strands. So, and I, like I told you, these are, uh, it's a hexamer and you can have four, four uh, ATP binding sites. I think I, may, I said six, I'm mistaken. At least four are visible right now. There might be more, who knows. So this is the structure of the helicase. It's a hexamer, six identical subunits. And if you notice, it kind of looks like a, a bay blade. So like, it looks like something that can spin. This central cavity, uh, which is present, that's where you have your DNA strand going in, one of the strands going in. So now we'll talk about uh, SSBPs again. Sorry about this. SSBPs, single stranded binding proteins. So what happens when uh, the helicase has split apart these strands? So now what will happen is uh, the you need some sort of um, protein, some something to stabilize this single strand. Otherwise, you'll have these hairpin loops forming around your DNA. So if, if these loops are formed, the DNA, uh, the polymerase cannot move further and the replication has to be stopped there. Well, technically not stopped there. There are other polymerases which can come and bind, but those are not very accurate. So those are not very accurate and not very fast. So if you want a fast and accurate process, you don't want these uh, hairpin loops forming. So uh, the SSBPs, the single stranded binding proteins are known as the helix destabilizing proteins. 
So these are helix destabilizing because if um, so if it's stabilizing a single strand, therefore it's destabilizing a helix. It's an inverse relationship. And they bind to the single stranded DNA without covering the bases. So in this in this diagram, it's not very clear. But when they bind to the uh, single stranded DNA molecule, uh, uh, DNA strand, uh, what happens is they bind to the phospho, uh, the sugar phosphate backbone, and the bases are left free. The bases are left free to interact with the with the polymerase and other bases that are coming in. So this is very important for the lagging strand, especially. Why do you think? So can someone type in the chat? Why do you think lagging strand is the one? it's very important for and why not the leading strand as well anyone can attempt this answer it's okay if you're wrong okay proline is typing what do you think is the answer the polymerase has to constantly detach and attach to the lagging strand. Yes, that's true. That happens. Therefore, when the polymerase has detached and it has to attach to this region again to, to synthesize this uh, uh, section in the, uh, in the middle, it needs single-stranded binding proteins to keep the, keep the DNA kink-free. And what happens on the lagging strand is, the, what happens on the lagging strand is it continuously synthesizing. So there's, no, there's a not, lot, uh, not a lot of time where the DNA has to stay single-stranded. So what I'm saying right now might might seem uh, something completely alien to you, but I have a video in this lecture. When I'll show you the video, you'll understand the entire process of how the lagging strand has a very little time to have the uh, single stranded uh, section, but the uh, sorry, the lagging strand has a lot of time to have the single stranded structure, uh, but the leading strand does not have a lot of time as a single stranded structure. So this is your SSBPs again. I just made this mistake throughout throughout the presentation. It's an SSBP. I forgot the P everywhere. Anyway, uh, so you have two domains on a single standard binding protein, and it binds to the sugar phosphate backbone. It, it has a palm-like groove or just a groove which binds to the sugar phosphate backbone, and the DNA bases are free. And if you look at this, it's a so this is showing your alpha helices and beta uh, alpha helices and beta pleated sheets so this is like a tertiary structure and this is where your dna is resting so this is the groove like the groove we uh, saw here so this is the groove which is formed from the beta pleated sheets uh, is there a question why is it helix destabilizing is it because it removes the hairpin structure which is stable so the helix unwinds the dna single strand dna can form hairpins which can prevent transcription Single, uh, so SSVs are also single stranded breaks. So SSVs and DSVs are used for breaks. So the single stranded binding protein has to be SSBP because SSV is a single stranded break. And it's helix destabilizing because it's stabilizing the un, non hairpin structure. It's stabilizing a single strand, therefore, it will destabilize a helix. So it's an inverse relationship. So it's, the naming is not very like it's not very intuitive it doesn't directly destabilize the helix because it cannot separate a helix the helicase separates the helix but the single stranded binding proteins ensure that the separate strands do not come together again or form hairpins so it, it directly cannot do anything it helps helicase in its action anyway now we'll talk about the sliding clamp so so in eukaryotes especially in us humans the, the rate of uh, the rate of replication is about 1000 nucleotides per second so that's a very high rate so so you need some sort of a mechanism to keep the polymerase on the on the strand so it continues synthesizing a new the the, the daughter strand and this is the sliding clamp so a sliding clamp is literally a ring a ring like structure which slides on your dna it's moving along with the DNA and keeps the polymerase attached to the DNA. Uh, if there was no sliding clamp, the polymerase would, uh, de uh, would detach after every few hundred base pairs. So the sliding clamp ensures that the polymerase is, is there for the long run. 
is there for thousands upon thousands of nucleotides. If there was no sliding clamp, the polymerase would detach and the process would be slowed down considerably. So this increases the processivity of DNA polymerase. So the processivity means how many, how many nucleotides can it synthesize in each run. And these are thousands upon thousands of nucleotides can be synthesized in each run of a polymerase. And this is uh, ensured by the sliding clamp. It keeps the polymerase bound to the DNA. It forms a ring around the DNA. So it looks like a kind of a ring. So it forms a ring around the DNA. And one end, so one end of this molecule binds to one end of the polymerase. And it's moving forward. It's pushing the polymerase forward. It keeps it on the strand. So the assembly of the clamp. So now we'll talk about how this clamp is put on to the DNA strand. So it needs uh, something called a clamp loader. So imagine a loader being a hand. Imagine it like a hand. It opens up the sliding clamp with the help of ATP. So ATP binds. It it opens up the sliding clamp and puts it onto the onto the DNA strand. And then the ATP is hydrolyzed and the clamp loader is pushed away. So think of ATP like a small like a small stick of dynamite. So that's what ATP is. When once you break the high energy bonds of, of ATP, you release a, you have a sudden burst of energy. And this burst of energy can be can be thought of like a small stick of dynamite. And once it goes off, something has to break or something has to detach or some work has some deformation has to occur. So in this case, when the ATP breaks, the clamp loader leaves the the sliding clamp once it's bound to the dna so the assembly of the clamp or uh, around the dna requires atp hydrolysis by a special protein complex the clamp loader so this is your sliding uh, this is your sliding clamp L literally a ring around around the dna uh, one one strand of dna and this is your clamp loader it has five domains and some it's somewhat like a nut you know screws and nuts right so nuts uh, can very uh, very nicely spin around a screw and tighten stuff up so what this does is the clamp loader once it's bound to, uh, once it has um, the sliding clamp on the dna the clamp loader will push it until it reaches a double stranded region so this double stranded region is the rna dna hybrid duplex we talked about in the last lecture so this hybrid duplex is there. One strand is DNA and the other strand is the RNA primer. And this once uh, once this entire complex has reached the primer, the end of the primer, that's when the clamp loader can leave and the polymerase can bind here and start uh, synthesizing the new strand of DNA. So I'll stop here to take a few questions. Does anyone have a question? Please put it up in the chat. Okay, two people, are, three people are typing. Is a sliding clamp a protein? Yes. I cannot tell you what, what the composition is, but yeah, it's a protein. So the explosion detaches the clamp loader. Yeah. Yeah, like Pierre said, it's a, it's a, it's a protein complex. You see, there are at least two proteins here. Two more people are typing. Can you repeat the sliding thing again? Like the clamp loader pushes the sliding complex part. Okay. So imagine your clamp loader like a nut. Your nut, you remember a nut can easily rotate around a screw or a bolt, right? Like it tightens things up. You need a wrench to tighten a nut up. So this has a similar concept. Uh, it is a five. Uh, so it has five units to it, and these five units rotate, kind of like rotate around the rotator with the. This is a sliding clamp, and it rotates until it reaches a, a region where there is a double strand. It can only rotate upon a single strand. Once it reaches a double-stranded region, it has to stop. Once, once the double-stranded re, uh, region has uh, has been reached, this will the clamp loader will hydrolyze the ATP and leave, and then you have the polymerase coming in to synthesize a new strand. Uh, there's another question. I wonder mechanically the top or bottom spin 
or they enter and leave without rotating i mean if you make something like this manually i guess there will be rotation now there is some rotation uh, you cannot say whether uh, like at least i'm not aware of what is exactly how it is rotating but the there's a it's just a nice little thought experiment to think about it rotating i have a video of your entire dna replication cycle and you will see there that the rotations are not very clear because of all the brownian motion etc uh, especially the thing is so fast it's hard it's hard to see so now it's a summary so you've learned about most of the car of the protein complexes involved in dna replication and we have not talked about eukaryotes right this is predominantly a prokaryotic mechanism which we talked about eukaryotes have a quite like a lot lot more things which are involved in the process so this is your leading strand the leading strand is, con is con uh, synthesized continuously the lagging strand has to be synthesized in parts therefore it's the semi discontinuous synthesis and then you have the primase which makes your rna primers you have the sliding clamps and the loaders you have the ssbps which are binding to the lagging strand to ensure it stays as a single strand then you have the helicase which is breaking apart the parent building in a helix and then i think that's about it and then you have okazaki fragments and rna primers the blue dotted section is your rna primer so once once the polymerase has reached this primer it will detach so the polymerase will not detach it will leave this uh, sliding clamp this uh, this part of the dna will flow forward and it will bind to uh, sorry not not here this part of the dna once so it will be much clearer when we see the video right now it's quite confusing to explain with just words so this is a uh, this is an image of how this process is occurring so it's quite hard to see here but like there's a artistic depiction here you have the parental so this is your parental dna helix according to the bottom diagram this is your entire replication machinery and so there must be some sort of a helicase here so the leading strand is being separated and the lagging strand is being looped around and this is one of the polymerases this is one polymerase so only one polymerase is synthesizing your lagging strand and the leading strand the leading strand polymerase might be somewhere around here so this is the video it's quite a long video uh, would you like to see the entire thing so they talk about a lot of other things as well or do you just want to see the dna replication part it's about a 3 i only cut out a 3 minute section of this video not the entire 7 minute thing So if everyone is fine with it I'll just start playing This is the like human cell 10000 times magnified and they're showing the nucleus right now This is your gene library remember I talked about histone molecules and this is your entire nucleosome and the histone tails bobbing around freely And if you notice gene transcript this is an actively transcribed region therefore the nucleosome here and the nucleosome here are quite far apart so this entire thing is quite exposed and then this is your nuclear pore complex we haven't talked about any of this yet it's it was just quite interesting so i just let it stay in the video that's your nucleus home forming and then each of these nucleus homes condenses to form the 30 nanometer fiber well we haven't talked about the latest theories but in your textbook it's the 30 nanometer fiber and then these 30 nanometer fibers can form loops and then these loops will condense to form chromosomes that's your mitotic chromosome
and this is mitot mitosis in action. These are uh, replicating cells, a dividing cell rather. Uh, so they've been pulled apart and then there'll be a split. Anyway, this is not something we have talked about yet. Now here comes the stuff we are supposed to. Oh, where the heck? Yeah, this is this is the stuff we are supposed to talk about. Oh no, don't tell me to start again. No, I'll just fast forward. To about three minutes. Yep. This is your entire uh, replication machinery. And let's go back a bit. Yeah. So that uh, this so try to understand what's happening. So this is your eukaryotic system. It's it's quite a bit different from the prokaryotic systems we talked about. So there's an entire protein, multi protein, multi enzyme complex rather, which is involved in the replication here. And the replication rate is about 1,000 nucleotides per second. And in prokaryotes in E. coli, at least, it's around 500 nucleotides per second. And so this is your leading leading strand. So this is the parent strand. It's being split by the helicase in dark blue. So dark blue is the helicase. It's being split. So this is your leading strand. And this is your lagging strand. So the lagging strand loops around uh, and comes back to the polymerase here. These two arms have the polymerases in purple. I think it's called purple. This is purple or violet, whatever. This purple is your polymerase. And these green thingies are your sliding clamps, the sliding clamps I talked about. So to see what happens, let's just go a bit forward. Well, let's, uh, let's I'll just talk about it right now then. So the DNA polymerase in the logging strand started synthesizing at this point. This is where the primer was. It started synthesizing and it will continue to synthesize until it reaches the end of this section. And once it reaches the end of this section, it will leave this sliding clamp. This new sliding clamp will join to the polymerase and it will grab a hold of somewhere around here and start synthesizing this section. So it's kind of going backwards. Once it's reached the end, sliding clamp leaves, it grabs another sliding clamp and then it synthesizes this section. You see how this switch of sliding clamps is occurring. So the leading strand synthesis is very continuous, but on the lagging strand, you see it has to loop back again and again and again. So this is the semi-discontinuous synthesis I was talking about. It's quite an interesting process. And it, this is close to real time as well. So this is how fast the entire thing is happening. Anyway, any questions until now? Yeah, the mechanism is very, very interesting. I will link to their channel, the Vehi channel. So it's W-E-H-I. It's the Walter Elizabeth, something, something, Elizabeth Hall Institute of Medical Sciences. They produce a lot of animations in biology. So it's very interesting to see a lot of these processes. They have a lot of epigenetic uh, mechanisms to animate it very nicely. We will come back to this video and we'll watch it completely after the after I've completed the entire thing. Teal proteins, yeah, the green thingies. The green teal thingies are the sliding clamps. We have one person typing, so we'll wait for their question to come and then we'll move on. If each cell has 1.5 uh, watt of DNA and replicating for 100,000 base pairs, it's not 100,000, it's 1,000. And that's in eukaryotes, it's about 500 in prokaryotes. How long will it take if it needed to run from start to finish? Well, 
what's the length of the entire human chromosome uh, human genome i'm not sure I, I i don't have that number off the top of my head if someone can just put it in google it pretty fast three giga base pairs uh well you can quite calculate three giga bases divided by 1000 bases and get the answer in the number of seconds possibly yeah getting the entire numbers thing 3 into 10 raised to 9 divided by 10 raised to 3 that will give you about 3 3 million seconds 3 million seconds divided by 60 uh who will do that 300,000 divided by 6 oh god dark blue the helicase yeah this dark blue is the helicase 50k 50,000 minutes long time but you don't have one complex working you have to remember that there are multiple complexes working together and each replication fork has uh, one complex you have at least two replication fork uh, at a time there's a lot many more complexes acting and the purple is the polymerase yeah this purple is the polymerase great so we'll move on to strand directed mismatch repair last time i talked about the uh, error correction much, uh, mechanisms in uh, present in the polymerase itself there were two mechanisms there you can go back to review if you want this time we'll talk about a mechanism which is external to the polymerase itself it uses different protein complexes and it is a strand directed repair system so what happens here is this system detects distortion in the dna helix so these distortions so imagine this as a distortion this is caused by a uh, mispairing of the bases. So if wrong base is, has been added at that point, this is cause a small kink in the DNA. And so, so once this kink is formed, if it's not corrected immediately, it will stay in the genome and it will cause issues later on. This is, this is unwanted mutations. You don't want it. So, so it's a strand directed mechanism. So imagine uh, the yellow is the parental strand and the red is the newly synthesized strand we know this because of the nick only the newly synthesized strand will have a nick so what happens is imagine it there was a mis uh, mismatch at this uh, position and the if the if the if the system can correct either of these bases to correct it so imagine this was an a and this is a g so a is the parental and g is the newly synthesized strand so you want to convert it to A and T, right? So A, A base pairs to T. But what if this so system can act on both strands? So if, the, if this is a G, it can convert this A to a C. That will still be a mutation. Even, even though you repaired, you technically repaired, you removed the kink, you have introduced a mutation. So this system has to know which, which strand to repair. And there are different mechanisms about how it can identify strands. It only needs to repair the newly synthesized strand because you assume the parental strand is 100% correct. Therefore, the error has to be in the new strand. Yeah, methylation, it's a given on the slide actually. <laughs> methylation is one mechanism that's used by prokaryotes. Eukaryotes use a different system. So, what happens in prokaryotes is you have uh, methylation of the parental strand. So, in the early moments, so soon after the replication, the newly synthesized strand is not methylated. So if the newly synthesized strand is not methylated, therefore the system knows the non-methylated uh, strand is the new strand. And this methylation is on the adenine of GATC sequences. So you have repeated GATC sequences in your genome and adenine of these sequences is usually methylated in prokaryotes at least. And then when you have a when you have the newly synthesized strand, so G A T C, the A here will be non-methylated, and that's how the prokaryotic system knows which is the which is the new strand. But in eukaryotes, the distinction is based on NICs. So these NICs here are what eukaryotes used to identify newly synthesized DNA because not all eukaryotes have methylation. So I know yeast doesn't have methylation, I think. Some other organisms don't have GATC methylation. So the mute S and mute L system are used 
to identify the gilly synthesized strand someone's microphone is on please turn it off yep so the new test new tell system can detect uh, a mis uh, mismatch in the base pairing and then it detects which is the newly synthesized strand based on the nick and it will get the nick cleave this entire section and leave and then the polymerase can come back and repair this entire blank and then you have a proper base pairing um there's some conversation going on 10000 origin yeah the number of origins of replication are huge and each origin replica replication has two replication forks so these two replication forks will have at least two machines uh, well let's just call them replication machines acting on them great um so can anyone tell me why this mechanism has its own issues why is the nick detecting mechanism having issues this was supposed to be a better mechanism compared to the methylation yeah it only works for the lagging strand because if you remember the lagging strand had the continuous okazaki fragments with these nicks the leading strand would have only one nick if at the end of the entire synthesis you have one mismatch you will have to go back to the first nick get it and cleave the entire section you just synthesized which is a waste of energy so uh, at least in the textbooks we uh, have prescribed for this course the mechanisms for these are uh, how these transient nicks so we don't definitely have no nicks on the leading strand so some sort of a transient nick has to be created for this system to work so i just want you all to read up and see what are the latest developments in these in this field this is not in the textbook so don't try to uh, finding it in the textbook we'll discuss this in the next class so now we uh, will see the uh, structure of mute s so this, this is the mute s system and how it detects a mismatch so how do you think the mute s system will detect a mismatch can anyone does anyone know well i mean the graduates would know but does anyone in high school or undergrad know yeah distance is high so what so what does that mean how does it detect this a greater distance or, or something else okay i don't think anyone has the answer so i'll just tell you right now what happens is uh, what mutes so what is hypothesized is mutes tries to find which areas it can bend easily so just think of it like a bending the dna and areas which can easily be bent have weaker hydrogen bonding or no hydrogen bonding if you have a mismatch the hydrogen bonding will be weak and that area will be easier to bend and that's how it detects the uh, a mismatch in the dna so areas with a regular, proper base pairing will not bend as easily so mutations in this uh, error correction the strand directed mismatch repair can lead to some forms of cancer so if you have if one of your parents had a defective allele and this defective allele got passed on to you your other allele is working but you still have a defective allele so by chance if you have some some random mutation in in one cell not even all cells if you have a, a random mutation in one cell in the other functional allele of the repair system that means now both of your alleles are non functional in that cell so there that will lead to a higher rate of mutation in that cell so this system can reduce mutations by 100 fold I told you that the mutation rate is about one in ten raised to nine per generation per cell. But if this system is completely off, the the error rate increases to one in ten raised to seven per per generation per cell. So ten raised to seven is like uh, about hundred million. So about one billion to a hundred million. So that's a huge jump, at least in terms of small cells. and if if this even if one cell has this uh, random mutation which is deactivating the other allele you will have high number of mutation and this high number of mutation gives you a higher incidence of cancer so is one cell enough to cause allele malfunction and therefore cancer one cell is not the cell itself is not ca causing the allele malfunction the cell itself is not so there is a mal malfunction occurring which is making this cell which may make this cell cancerous i'm not saying cancer will always happen 
it may lead to cancer it gives you a higher chance of getting cancer what is cancer cancer is basically uh, a rapid division of cells which is uncontrolled you the cell does not know when to die it continues uh, replicating itself until until this starts draining your bodily systems well at least this is a very very generalized definition of cancer so even if one cell is uh, not able to repair and it has somehow led to mutations in its uh, in its repairing genes this will lead to higher mutations in the tumor suppressor genes and if you have mutations in the tumor suppressor genes your tumors will not be suppressed the growth will not be controlled and this uncontrolled growth can lead to cancer and this uh, so one example of this kind of cancer is a hereditary non -poly, uh, non, non polyposis colon cancer HNPCC. If you want to read more about it, you can. And the spontaneous mutation of the functional gene can produce a clone of the somatic cells. We're talking about somatic cells here that accumulate mutations unusually rapidly. So this accumulation of mutation is what leads to cancer. The mechanism you're talking about uh, is the one from which comes that each day you have to fight a possibility of cancer. Yes, each day you have to fight it. Every time your cells replicate, there is a possibility of a random mutation occurring and there is a possibility you might have cancer but this possibility is very very low it's like very low but eventually in a lifetime some i don't know where i read this i think it was some some sort of talk uh, but eventually most humans or all humans will develop some form of cancer but this cancer may not be life-threatening or it may be controlled by your body so in, well this is just a i don't have anything to uh, verify this claim but well you can read up about this yourself if you want how exactly does mutation cause the allele to deactivate so it's not technically not deactivate it doesn't stop functioning but the protein product it may form will not function so if you have uh, some sort of a mutation in the active re say if it was coding for an enzyme so it's coding for the mute s enzyme so the mutes protein and what if there was a single amino acid or maybe a few amino acid mutation in one of the uh, alpha helices which uh, which are responsible for testing the bend of the dna what if there was a mutation it cannot detect bends anymore if it can't detect bends it can't repair and if it can't repair it will lead to a higher incidence of mutations so it's sort of an indirect way to cause cancer it doesn't directly cause cancer That's correct. I am glad you understand that. Okay, quite a few people are typing. We'll just wait for the questions. There's just a few more slides after this, so we're close to the end. I need to ask this in the sense of evolution how much mutations has influenced evolution mutations are the cause of evolution mutations do cause natural selection so these random mutations may give you a trait which may be beneficial or which may not be beneficial and that's how your natural selection occurs mutations are what cause the variation in genetic diversity on the leading strand, apart from the transient mechanism you talked about, what was the inefficient method? I, I'm not, I'm not understanding what your question is. Transient mechanism for, oh, the NIC, oh, sorry, the NIC one. Inefficient method? I didn't talk about any inefficient method. Oh, oh, I was talking about how the, if it was trying to uh, cleave, if you look at this diagram, it needs to cleave from the NIC to the area of uh, mismatch so if then say imagine this is the start of your replication and this is some hundred thousand base pairs in between hundred thousand maybe a million base pairs and at the end of replication you have found one mismatch and if this was a leading strand and if it depended <coughs> sorry if it dependent only on one nick you would have to cleave this entire strand this entire hundred thousand or million base pairs you just synthesized, you would have to remove this entire strand and resynthesize it. So that doesn't help anyone. 
if you had to resynthesize, there might be more mutations. Who, there's no guarantee that the mutations will be fixed. So the NICs need to be closer to, to, the, area, to the area of uh, mismatch so that only a short section is cleaved out and only the short section, uh, section has to be prepared, not the entire replication cycle. Yeah, it has to replicate from the start, therefore it's an inefficient. That's why th this is definitely not happening. So there has to be some transient nick kind of a thing which may be occurring, which may explain how the system works on the leading strand. Can there be kinks without having a weak edge bond, hence not getting detected? If, uh, if, if it was a strong hydrogen bond, if it was fitting nicely into the far, into the backbone, there will be no kinks. Say, imagine if it was a nucleic acid analog. So there are nucleic acid analogs, which are not your regular nucleic acid. And these can come and bind, and these can cause mutations later on. So they, those will not form kinks, and the hydrogen bonds will be strong. Can there be kinks without having a weak hydrogen bond? If it was forming a strong hydrogen bond, it would, it would, base pair with, uh, it would be a correct base pair, right? Base pairing is the strongest only with your complementary partner. It depends on the number of, uh, also the distance of the sugars. So non-complementary non partners will have a different distance from each other. And this distance has to be constant throughout the strand. So A, T and G, C, these are the constant distance pairs. So A, G and C, T will not form, they will not be at the same distance as the other base pairs. This will be the kink. I am unable to form my question properly. Okay, great. We will discuss this after the lecture. Okay, so this is a mutate system. I talked about this. Then we will come on to topwise or mirror. So imagine if you have if you had two lengths of string, very long strings, and you had to pull them apart, and these strings were attached to the wall. Imagine you they were attached to the wall. If you keep pulling these two uh, strings, which are coiled upon each other, at one point you'll be unable to pull anymore because the coils have become so tight, it can't rotate anymore. And instead of an end, instead of attaching at your wall, imagine it was kilometers long, kilometers upon kilometers long. You would need a large amount of energy to pull these strings apart because the kilometers of that string has to be rotated. So you can't have the entire chromosome rotating as the helicase is pulling apart the strands. There has to be some other mechanism which is relieving this supercoiling. So what happens is to prevent the tangling and the winding problem. So, so you don't have the entire chromosome rotating. So if there was no mechanism, you would have a winding problem because then the entire length of DNA would have to be rotated just because this area was replicated. So every 10 bases, we talked about how one turn of the B DNA is about 10 bases long. So that every 10 bases of replication, you would need, uh, you would have an entire turn of DNA. And in prokaryotes, at least, you have 500 nucleotides uh, synthesized per second so that's 50 turns every second so it has to turn at a rate of 50 revol uh, revolutions per minute that's a very high speed to rotate the entire chromosome this would disrupt a lot of other things as well so topoise homer is uh, so you have the enzymes which can relieve this uh, supercoiling and these are called topoise homerases and these swivel one strand of the dna around the other to relieve the tension so, uh, so there are two forms of topoisomerases and these are reversible nuclease. So a nuclease is something that will cleave the phosphodiester backbone and this is a reversible nuclease because once it cleaves, once the supercoiling has been relieved, it will reform that bond. So it's a reversible nuclease and there are two forms, the topoisomerase 1 and 2. So I have one question about this that you have to read up upon. Why? So what's the difference between topoisomerase 1 and 2? I'll be talking about the physical differences, but what advantage does one have over two and what advantage does two have over one? This you need to read up about. 
and so so how the topo isomer is one acts is it produces a transient nick so don't get confused with the transient nick here and the transient nick i talk about i talked about in the new test new tail system that's a different thing this is a different thing the topo isomer is one produces a transient nick uh, allowing one section of dna to rotate freely so this is a graphical depiction of what happens so this is uh, so these two ends cannot rotate relative to each other so this is not a very flexible structure so what uh, a type 1 uh, topo isomerase will do is it will bind to the at, at one particular site it will cause a cleavage it will not leave the phosphate it attaches to the dna phos uh, to the phosphate but the phosphate is not left the phosphate is still bound to it and then it will break this bond the other section can now rotate freely so this uh, it, only one strand it's possible to rotate upon this is not a very rigid structure bonds can chemical compounds can rotate around each other but uh, they can't rotate if there are two strands so one strand is broken this allows their entire rotation to take place this will continue until the entire superpurling has been relieved once it's relieved once the once the say the polymerase is up to this point your topo isomerase is ahead is ahead of all the replication machinery and it's causing a, a, a break quite ahead and that is relieved and when once this uh, replication machinery reaches closer it will reattach the phosphate so remember the phosphate was not lost it was bound to the phosphate and it now returns the phosphate and the bond is formed again and it will just leave the complex and move ahead further so so there's no energy in this process you don't have to provide atp because it never released any energy but in topo isomerase 2 what happens is they form a covalent linkage with both the strands of the helix if you see here the uh, topo isomerase 1 binds only to one strand it doesn't interact with the other strand at all zero interaction here all the interaction is localized to one strand but in the topo isomerase 2 it binds to both strands it's bound here it's bound here as well and uh, so it is activated on chromosomes where two double helices cross over each other so basically what they mean to say is it, it will activate where there's a lot of supercoiling so there's a lot of supercoiling where there is a lot of replication occurring so it will bind to dna where close to the replication sites a little ahead and what it does is it will cleave one strand of the dna it will get the other one to pass through and reform this bond but what happens is this process requires ATP. So topo isomerase 2 needs ATP, but one did not require ATP. So the ATP binds, and the uh, so so, the, so it binds to two of the domains, two ATPase domains, and it causes a break in the double star. So one of the strands of DNA, and it will just get it to pass down, and then the strand is resealed, and the topo isomerase 1 leaves. So what they observe was this entire process of cleaving and recleaving this does not require atp what requires atp is the resetting of the entire complex so the atp uh, is uh, atp is bound to this entire molecule atp is bound to the two atps domains here like i don't know exactly where but it's bound somewhere here and it doesn't cleave yet it cleaves after the process is done to reset this uh, spent enzyme to to be able to bind to a new strand again so what they did to identify this was they used atp homologues so atp homologues are molecules which resemble atp but have no energy on themselves so they those are low energy molecules which which are mimicking atp and they bind so they what what was noticed was upon the binding of the of the clone of atp the process occurred once but it did not occur again therefore it was concluded that so this is i'm just giving a very very general description of what what the experiment was i will not go into the details because it's not required at this point so what they observed was once the homologue of atp sorry not a homologue a clone of the atp which did not have energy was bound the process occurred once but it did not occur again because the atp is required to reset 
the complex. If, if there's no ATP, the complex will not reset and it will not be able to perform its job again. That's the entire function of ATP in this complex. So the breaking of bond here and resealing did not require ATP. And here as well, the breaking of the bonds and resealing did not require ATP. And that's about it for this lecture. Double helix one and two refers to individual strands as, uh, no, these are double helices. So this is a proper, this is a helix. I think it might be confusing for you. I'll try to look for some other uh, animation which will show you this entire process properly. So these are double helix. These are two strands. These are two strands. So the function of topoisomer is 1 and 2 is very, very different. And maybe once you read up about why it's different and why are both required, you will understand why it's differing, like very fundamentally. So there are, yeah, there are two double, uh, two helices here. So this might be just one helice which has coiled up over itself. Imagine it's connected somehow here. So it has coiled up over itself. So this needs to be relieved. This one requires ATP not for the cutting and joining. It requires ATP to reset the molecule. The cutting and joining does not require ATP. What requires ATP is the resetting of the enzyme to enable it to do its job again. I'm glad it was cleared. Please type in your questions now. We are at the end of the presentation. So that's about it for today's lecture. I didn't get this. Why I need to pass a double strand like this? Uh, it's very difficult to imagine without an actual physical demonstration. Uh, I'll try to look for a proper animation for this so it's clearer in a video format. It's hard to explain it in static images and words. So topo isomerase 1 is to uncoil the two DNA strands and topo isomerase is needed to uncoil the DNA helix. Yeah, it's quite like that. But once you read more about it, it will get a lot over clear. Yeah, you can talk uh, talk in the voice chat. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, regarding, uh, have a, I had a doubt in the king. Mm -hmm. Right? So, um, what I understand until now is the uh, the two molecules that the, the two com components that bind themselves mm -hmm. they'll be of particular shape that mm -hmm. the strand is uh, uh, almost a uniform line yeah right uh, uh, in a general scenario mm -hmm. and uh, when mutate we might have kinks yeah right yeah now my question is can the now the kinks occur because the bond is uh, weak, so the thing has kind of shifted a little. So that is why we are able to uh, visualize the kink, and hmm. and then uh, the rest of the process continued smoothly. So yeah. there's a kink at only one position. Yeah. My question is, uh, so uh, the, uh, the molecule, the, the the structure that goes and finds mm -hmm. out these kinks, is to pull it apart and see uh, which one is moving. It right? doesn't pull it apart. Kind of like it doesn't pull it apart. It kind of bends. Uh, where is that? Yeah. So if you see, it's not pulling this kink apart. It's bending the DNA around it. Okay. It's not pulling huh. it apart. Okay. Uh, it, it is bending and so it will have a mechanism to sense how much it bends, right? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Now my question is, can there be a kink with still a... Uh, um a strong hydrogen bond if it is a strong uh, hydrogen bond it's not a kink then it's uh, no more a kink. That, and, uh, i understand what, what you're telling uh, like I, I was thinking in eccentric terms what if the molecule was also attracted to the fluid or uh, the other substance nearby yeah uh, till now we are only in interaction within the dna molecules right yeah then it will be surrounded yeah. by other molecules right? yes definitely what if there's a kink because it, it was being pulled by another molecule. 
so the bond okay. is still strong okay so so but the uh, effect of say say imagine it was a water molecule the effect of water molecule will will be uniform throughout the dna right it will not just be at one spot which which it has a different effect than the other other units so it will this have the is... same effect here it will have the same effect here so the so this is sort of like a normalizing process it will normalize for this uh, sort of interaction with water okay and this uh, the super the coiling of the, the the rotation of the double helix prevents other molecules from accessing the nucleic acids so there's not a lot of interaction and even if there is it's mostly just with water and even if uh, so and if it's with water it's throughout the entire cell all of the genome is affected equally by this process so imagine if you had some sort of an anomaly in your data but your but the anomaly was uniform throughout the data so you can easily account for this anomaly right uh, I, i'm getting it the gen most of the the molecules the uh, adenine thymine guanine and cytosine yeah. they will interact with water the same yeah. way what the uh, the molecule that uh, the substance that is causing the kink mm -hmm. that might be interacting with water right what is causing the kink what molecule uh, are you talking about okay i i need to get clear on that again yeah so uh, kink is not caused by anything the kink is the effect of a mismatch okay so nothing is causing the kink except just a general not a 100% bond between the two molecules there then definitely be hydrogen interaction hydrogen bondings are very common but it will not be as um, as normal or at the same distance or as strong as the rest of the bonding and if it is exactly like everything else then it's a mutation and then it's a proper mutation which will be passed on okay so it's possible to have a mutation which is not detected by this mechanism it's not foolproof it's not perfect okay i'm glad okay. yeah. yeah thank you uh, there's a question on the last slide but why is like unmaking a knot uh why is it necessary to have this mechanism to understand the purpose of replication of the sequence but not passing one strand through the other so if you note if you watch the video completely if you notice uh, the the one uh, at the one hand the hands are pulling apart the string and it's forming some sort of a a loop at uh, in the middle of the dna right so imagine that string is dna so that loop has to be resolved and that loop is a double stranded uh, crossing over so where two double helices cross over each other as soon as as soon as a double he helix has crossed over one other double helix this enzyme is activated so so the exaggerated situation in the video never occurs even if there's one crossing over this will go and relieve that crossover i think just look at the video again and again and if you have if you still have questions i'll try to look for some other video which explains it better so i think that's about it i'll just uh, stop the recording here you can still ask me questions after this